All right. Welcome, everybody. This is the first ever financially lit virtual book tour. Shout out <laughs> to my sister, Janice Torres. Y'all know her, but I'm going to do a little formal introduction for the people who are going to watch this. She's an award-winning Latina money expert and became an accidental entrepreneur after a job loss that led to her create a successful Latin food blog called Delish Delights. You guys can check it out at delishdelights.com. Now she helps her clients and listeners build successful online businesses that allow them to pursue financial independence and freedom. She's on a mission to educate marginalized communities on topics like entrepreneurship, investing, and financial independence through her personal finance podcast, Yo Quiero Dinero, and her brand new book, okay, she is a published author, Financially Lit, was published by Grand Central Publishing on April 30th, 2024, and get your copy at financiallylitbook.com. Sis, I mean, yes. I've talked to you about this before. It's just so crazy to say that, like, you are an actual author. How do you yes, feel now that you've, like, been in it for a while? That's my face. That's my face right there. That's yes. crazy. Um, <laughs> honestly, it's been so inspiring, um, going around the country, even going to Puerto Rico and like realizing the impact of the platform that we've built. Uh, you know, obviously for those of you who have been rocking here from day one, like things really started popping off during the pandemic. And so for the majority of this, you know, entity existence, it's been virtual. And so just the idea that I've built something that has real world impact and now like hearing your stories and getting that real world, like those hugs and the messages and the people crying when they meet me and like having moments where they're just like, oh my God, thank you for what you do. It's like, oh my God, people actually listen to this. People actually reading this book. This shit is crazy. So Yes, sis. Yes. Yes, they are. <laughs> I want to plug in my laptop as you continue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I just want to say I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of the work that you're doing. And you're really out here making a difference. Shout out to y'all that are here. Please use the chat. I want this to be interactive. I want you guys to talk to each other. I want you to submit your questions. I'm going to keep periodically putting in the link that you guys can submit your questions to ask Janice. Agnes said, it was the final push that I needed to start working with a Latina financial advisor and tackle my debt and inc increase streams of income. We love that. We love okay. to see that. We, we, that's, that's the purpose behind what you're doing, right? So yes, yes. It's people not are just listening. about reading the book. It's no. about taking action with what you're learning. Okay. Yes. Like, I don't want you guys to be perpetual students without applying the lessons. This is literally meant to empower you to make those decisions, to be your own best advocate, to inform yourself of things that you haven't learned about in the past, and to keep coming back to when you confront new areas of your financial life, right? The reason this book is written the way that it is, it's so comprehensive because it's intended to follow you throughout your financial journey. It's not just meant to cover the basics of budgeting and saving and investing. Obviously, we know we need to be doing that, but we also need to be having like real ass conversations about what it looks like to build generational wealth and pass it on and protect it. There's so much more beyond just the basics. And so I really hope that this book becomes like your money Bible. You just keep coming back to it because there's so many stories in here and so much knowledge that you're going to find different areas of your life that you're going to have to kind of come back to refresh, you know, renew your, your information uh, just so that you feel empowered to make those decisions. Yes, sis, I'm here for it. And I outlined the questions that I'm going to ask you one per chapter. There's 10 chapters, so 10 questions. And the first chapter is based around money trauma and money mindset. It's titled The Struggle is Real. So in your experience and expertise, how can someone begin to heal from financial trauma and shift their mindset to develop a healthier relationship with money? And why is this first step so crucial? Well, I'll answer your second question first. Um, the reason why we need to do this is because at the root of it, your money does what your mind tells it to do. And if what you got going on up here is all crazy and messed up and just like not 
serving your best interests, then your money is going to be a reflection of that. You know, I think we give too, we give too much power to just this idea of money, this concept of money, as if it just does whatever it does. And I promise you, it's not. It's not a living entity. It is an extension of who you are. So your money is a direct reflection of what is going on with your mental health, your personal life, your professional life, all those things. Um, and so I have found that time and time again, it doesn't really matter what you tell someone to do. And we know this if we think about different aspects of our life where it's like, oh, I know I need to eat healthy. I know I should probably, you know, get exercise regularly. I should probably sleep eight hours. But how many of us are really good at like that accountability, at sticking to it? It's hard, especially when you don't feel empowered, when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel like you don't have the right resources, the right information. There's so many things that play into it, right? And so I think it comes down to understanding that your mental health is the foundation of your money journey. And until we get to the bottom of our traumas, of the things that we've experienced, of the belief systems that we have, it's going to feel like our money controls us versus us being in control of our money. And so for a lot of folks, I think it's going to involve going to therapy, potentially working with a financial trauma coach, um, doing personal development, learning, right? Because part of what um, makes fear more pervasive is feeling un incompetent. So that lack of knowledge, learning, trying things, being okay with making mistakes. I promise you, everybody who is out here who is a legitimate educator has made mistakes. And many times we're educating from that place of, I did this and I screwed up. And now I'm telling you what not to do so that you don't have to repeat those mistakes, right? Any guru out here who like swears they never made a mistake in their life, they're a red flag. Don't talk to them. Don't listen to them. They're toxic. Um, we, on the other side, are real life people who tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I talk about a lot of those different mistakes that I made in the book. And uh, it's all part of it, right? It's all part of it. When you get comfortable investing, the only regret usually people have is like not starting sooner. But it's that getting over the hump, the fear the messaging that you've gotten, like, oh, it's gambling. Oh, you're going to lose your money. Oh, you don't know what to invest in, right? And all of that, those narratives influence how we operate. So it takes time and it takes practice and it takes community. And so being in an environment like this, um, surrounding yourself with people who are also trying to better themselves and learn more about money, this is how we start to change the mindset that is then the, you know, what sets you up for the future. And I think also, you know, just thinking about my own healing personal development journey, what really has helped me is accepting, acceptance of where you are in your journey and being okay with that, having some self-compassion, being like, maybe my finances are not great and that's okay, but I do have the ability and the power to make the change and doing it small steps at a time. I think that's super crucial for anyone who wants to change their relationship with money or start working out or whatever it is that you want to do, like accepting where you are right now, but knowing that you do have the power to make that change. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Part two, and I see this comment by Annabelle, I resonated with the guilt part of making it, which is perfect because we're going to chapter two titled when Jenny from the block becomes Jenny with the bag. So we all love a good glow up story and you're very open with your own journey on how you've been able to reach financial success. So part one of the question, can you share a moment when you realized you were on your way to financial success? What did that look like for you? And what was your mindset like during that transition? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think I knew that I was on my way when I became debt-free because I had been, you know, very much indoctrinated in the typical like American narrative where like debt is normal and it's just a fact of life and you're just going to spend your whole life kind of navigating it and dealing with it. And when I was able to pay off my student loans, uh, like a couple of weeks before the pandemic and I realized, oh shit, I don't owe anybody money. Like, oh, this is nice. You know, like I don't have to be sending Sally Mae $500 a month for the next 25 years anymore. This is a vibe, you know? 
Um, and so that for me was a huge deal because then I realized like all this money that I'm earning, I can actually do whatever I want with it. I can set up future me for success. Like it's not about paying back maybe some financial mistakes that I've made and some overspending and some mindless spending. This is all me now. And once I got to that point of being debt free and I see it when I look at my net worth tracker, cause I've been tracking my net worth now for like five years consistently. And you see the exponential growth when you don't have to put money towards debt. You can put it towards investments. You can put it towards savings. And it just went boom. You know, it's like all of a sudden, oh, we hit 100K in investments. Oh, wait a minute. We hit 200K. And it's just like it rolls like a snowball down a hill, but in the opposite direction, you know, because it's just like, oh, my God. So much more progress is being made when I'm not stretched thin and trying to like, you know, find somewhere where I can squeeze out a couple extra pennies to save some money or pay off some debt. So that was the huge first step that then gave me the space to really go in on entrepreneurship and not have this fear of like, how am I going to pay my student loans if this business doesn't go well, right? It just gives you more space. It gives you like a runway to be able to make some maybe riskier decisions that you wouldn't do when you have all this pressure of owing money. What yeah. was the second part of the question? I didn't ask it yet, but I'm going to ask okay. it now. So what would be a piece of advice that you would give to someone who is probably the first in their friend, friend group or family to quote unquote, make it out. And they're struggling with feelings of that wealth guilt. And I know that's something that you talked about in the book too. So what would you tell someone? Yeah. You know, that part of the chapter, or I think that whole chapter has been like one of the ones that people have continuously reached out to me about. And they're just like, whoa, nobody's talking about this, but like a lot of us are experiencing this, what it looks like to be on the other side, to be the one that's like, you know, the first in your family to make six figures or the first in your family to be able to like, like buy a home or live in a nicer neighborhood. And, and you're just like, you're not living in the struggle anymore. And there's this isolation almost that comes from being able to make it out because when you come back to your hometown and you visit the family that's still struggling and you're just like, Damn, you know, it's almost like you feel a sense of guilt in one way, but then you also feel a sense of some obligation to like do more, but then that puts all this stress on you. So it's hard, you know, and I think the thing for me that has made it, I don't want to say easier to navigate, but it's just like I've given myself more space to just feel those emotions is by talking about it to other people. Because you'd be surprised, you know, <laughs> you'd be surprised who around you is also like experiencing this pressure, whether it's knowing that you're your parents retirement plan or feeling like, damn, I want to save for my kids and, and help them with college, but I'm still paying off my student loans. And like, should I be saving for my retirement instead of worrying about that? And then, you know, there's just so many things that are being put on our shoulders as first generation wealth builders that I think the more you talk about it, the more you get a sense that you're not alone in this journey. And um you know, there's support out here. They're just the camaraderie of feeling like you're not alone in that journey, I think does a lot for your mental health. And then it also gives you different perspectives of like how people are planning for this, right? I've talked to friends of mine who are in the same situation where they're like, I am my parents' retirement plan. And then we all just start talking about, well, what does that look like for you? And some of the times it's like, oh, well, you know, my siblings and I, we've put together a plan to create a savings account for mom and dad. Or we decided we're going to buy a rental property and we're going to use that to help mom and dad like supplement their income. Right. But like, if you don't talk about this stuff, it's overwhelming and it feels like you're alone when at the end of the day, there's a lot of us going through this shit in some version. And we just got to talk about it because that's how we come to solutions. And that's how we prevent ourselves from like that overwhelm that can just make things feel so much heavier than they have to be. Yes, that is the hill that I will stand on until I can't anymore. The power of storytelling and just t speaking your truth and finding yeah. those communities that you can lean on that can help you so much on your journey. So yes, I agree. Okay, chapter three, know your worth, mujer. You focus on the importance of self-worth in making financial decisions. What is a piece of advice you would tell someone in order to increase their confidence and turn that into their financial power? Mm. Well, you know, the thing about advocating for yourself is that it has ripple effects across your entire life. 
you know, once you start getting good at advocating for yourself, whether that's going to work and demanding more pay because you know that you're being overworked and underpaid or, you know, going to your partner and saying, we need to have more conversations around money because I don't feel empowered right now. And I don't feel like I know what's going on or standing up to that financial advisor who's trying to sell you on some bullshit annuity or whatnot without trying to explain to you what it is that you're buying. Like there are a lot of opportunities for us to advocate for ourselves and it almost becomes like a muscle. It becomes a reflex. Like when you get good at just, hold on a second, this is not right. And I need you to do something about it and not just take it, right? Because so many of us have gotten that programming of like, calladita te ves mas bonita. Don't make noise. Don't speak up. Don't piss people off. Don't be bitchy. And none of that is serving us. All of that is just making us small. It's keeping us in our, our place, right? Like the good little women and the good little girls that you're supposed to be. That shit's not serving anybody. And if we want this world to be a better place for not only ourselves, but also for future generations, like we have to be those empowered people that then raise empowered children that then keep going, right? That changes the world. So I'm a firm believer that you have to just get really comfortable making people uncomfortable, whether that's asking for more money or negotiating the price of a car or the price of a house or whatever, whatever it is in your life that you know is just like, nah, something's got to change here. I need, I need some, something to improve. Um, you get more and more confident when you do that. It's it's literally a muscle and you have to exercise it. Yeah. And that's on knowing your worth, right? Facts. I love that. All right. Chapter four, stop chasing the dream and start getting real with your dinero. In this chapter, you shared about the disaster that you went through when you bought your fir first home and the lessons that you experienced. Two questions. Why is it important to stop chasing the American dream? Let's start off with that. Well, I think the American dream is dead. The one that we were told about that, you know, go to school, get a degree and you'll be guaranteed a good job with a pension. And you can retire at 65. Like that's a lie. That is a whole ass lie. Um, we see it with our parents. We see it with our elders. All of these quote unquote things that we're supposed to be able to accomplish just by following that dream is becoming impossible. You know, millennials are at a point where home ownership is vastly out of reach. People are choosing not to have families. People are choosing not to have children. People are choosing or not even choosing. They're being forced to like continue living with their parents because it's just the money's not mathing, right? The math is not mathing. And so the American dream has to be redefined. And it starts with you questioning all those narratives, right? It's not to say that college is a waste of money. But what you go to school for should be something that you are very intentional about. Do I actually need to get into 100K of debt to make $40,000 a year? That doesn't make mathematical sense to me, right? Um, it's just like, do you actually need to do this? Is college the only option? No. I think we should be talking to you know kids that are thinking about what their careers are going to be. It's not just college. You can go to school and learn a trade. You can start a business. You can take a gap year and go and work and see if you just want to be in industry right away, right? It's not like there's not a one size fits all approach. And I think for a long time, we've been told that it's one way and that one way has not worked out for so many people. So I think it's just important to use your self-discretion, use common sense, like does this make sense for the type of life that I want? And and using that approach for everything that you do with your money and, and otherwise, I think that's just such an intentional way to live. Because what happens to a lot of people is like, I've asked them, well, why did you go into this career? Oh, I wanted to make money. Oh, my parents said I should do this. Oh, you know, it looked cool on TV. Okay, <laughs> but you're miserable. So like, now what? You know, and just kind of giving yourself permission to to come to that realization that maybe the season of your life is over and it's okay to change too. I think that's so important. Like we get stuck in careers, in relationships, in decisions. And then 
at some point, sometimes it's just not for you anymore. And we're so afraid to make that change because we've wrapped our whole identities in this thing that then that becomes another crisis. It's like, oh my God, but what if I want to do something else, you know? And then seeking approval from other people on making those decisions. Like, you know what? I got time. It's your life. It is your life. And if the thing that you thought was going to work is not working, you need to change it. Or you're going to wake up 5, 10, 20 years down the road and be like, oh, wow, my life looks exactly the same because I didn't do anything. Yes. You answered the second part of the question. I mean, okay. I want to talk about intention. Yes. I love that. Yeah. And I mean, the time is going to pass anyway. So right. Yeah. 40 something plus years is a long time to be working a job that you do not enjoy. That is a Period. long ass time to be not having fun. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I love that. Somebody needed to to hear that. <laughs> Erica said, yes, preach. So true. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. We're halfway through. I definitely want to be able to get to your guys' questions. Um, chapter five, sis, you need a side hustle. We know that you are the side hustle queen. You stand <laughs> on that hill. That is, that is how you've been able to create the success that you have by starting off as a side hustle. So how do side hustles contribute to financial resilience? And what is one piece of advice you would offer for readers looking to explore additional income streams? Yeah. Well, I'll say we should all be thinking about increasing our income streams from at least, you know, something beyond just a single paycheck. Because if you have been watching the news or experiencing it in real life, like layoffs are happening, the economy is cooling. I saw the unemployment numbers um, have hit an, a one year high at this point. More people have filed for unemployment in the past 12 months than, um, you know, the previous year. And so the fact of the matter is that all of our jobs are at will, you know, for the most part. And you could walk into work at any point and just be on the roster of, well, your position has been eliminated, X, Y, Z. And if you don't have a backup plan, it is very easy to let a layoff disrupt your finances and cause financial chaos. Okay. Especially if you live in a ghetto ass state like Florida, like me, where max unemployment is $275 a week for 13 weeks. Okay. I don't know who's going to do what with $275 a week. Okay. Literally, that's not even going to be enough to cover groceries for the month. And so that's the world that we live in. And knowing that you have to be your own financial safety net. And that's what a side hustle for me represents, right? When I first started my food blog back in 2013, it was a hobby until I got laid off and I realized, oh, this could be more than that. This could absolutely be like a whole business. And when I started like diving into the finances and the business of, you know, online content creation, I was immediately hooked because it represented so much more than just being able to make money. Um, it also represented flexibility, which for me has always been like a beacon of um, like a life pillar for me. I'm like, I need to have flexibility in my life in all forms. You know, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so like, uh, I'm not anti homeownership, but for me, it just takes me a lot to commit to that because again, homeownership for me represents a lack of flexibility. Whereas me being a renter, I can just, you know, notify my landlord 30 days notice, blah, blah, blah. I'm out. I like that. I like being able to have options and being able to work from anywhere with an online business for me represented a lot of that flexibility for me. Um, so I think when it comes to figuring out how to start a side hustle, I always tell people you have two sets of skills. You have your personal skill set. Those are the things that you're good at. Those are the things that maybe are hobbies for you. Maybe you already have like an existing side hustle, but you're not really taking it serious. Those things that people ask you about, that you're the expert in your circle, those are your personal skill sets. And then all the things that you've picked up along your professional career too, whether that's in school or in your you know, workplace, you have skill sets too that can be turned into a business. And so I would say the first thing to do is start by listing out all those things that you enjoy doing, that you're good at doing, that you're qualified to do, and rank them in order of, if I could do one thing for the rest of my life, this would be at the top. And if I if there was no amount of money that somebody could pay me to do this, that's at the bottom of your list, right? And for me, like engineering at this point is at the bottom of the list because I know I can make a lot of money doing it, but do I want to do it? No, I don't want to do it. Like nobody could pay me enough to be a consultant in their engineering firm. 
It's just not for me. Like that phase of my life has passed. Now, that's not to say, God forbid, you know, things got crazy and I had to go back to work. At least I know that I have that skill set. But is it going to be the thing that I prioritize? No. You know? And so I think that's what we need to take a look at. Yeah. And y'all remember, these jobs are ghetto. Okay. <laughs> We, we need, need that, that on a shirt. shirt. Yes. <laughs> and a hat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Chapter six. Investing ain't just for white dudes. You can do no, it too. Not. I love that. Okay. So investing can feel scary AF, especially for people in our communities, communities of color. What are some entry points or resources you recommend besides your book for someone who wants to start investing but has zero clue where to begin? Ooh. Well, um, you know, now with the power of the internet, there's just so much information out here, y'all. Before I wrote a book, before I had a podcast, I was literally out here learning about investing on blogs, L listening to podcasts, incredible podcasts like the So Money Podcast by Farnoosh Chirabi, Journey to Launch by Jamil Soufrant, uh, even Susie Orman's podcast, Women and Money. You know, it's about just getting curious. You know, curiosity for me is, I think it's such an underrated character trait because when you're curious, that means you are a natural learner. And when you are a natural learner, you are able to not be intimidated by the idea that you don't know something. You actually are able to go out and seek this information, right? I think there's this perception that if you're a certain age, you need to be an expert in money. And if you are past that age for some reason, like it's not okay to go and teach yourself. It's not okay to go and ask questions. And that's dumb because let's be honest, none of us have learned this stuff. And even the people that go to school for finance do not learn how to manage their money, okay? I've talked to folks that are CFOs who've worked in the financial industry, who are professionals in every sense of the money world, you know, Wall Street investors, None of these people learn about the basics of finance. And so if they're not learning and you don't know, that's a sign that this is intentionally being withheld from us. Okay. And so you have to get, you have to, again, this goes back to the self-advocacy. You have to say, I'm going to empower myself with information. I'm going to read this damn book 17 times until I understand how this works. I am going to take $5 and I'm going to open an investment account and I'm going to buy my first investment with $5. And then when I realized that I did not spontaneously explode and the world did not come crashing down, I can actually put another $5 in and oh my God, just keep doing that, right? But it's like taking the baby steps. It wasn't too long ago that you had to have thousands of dollars to open an investment account. I'm talking $2,500, $3,000. Nowadays, you can literally start investing with a dollar. Most of y'all have spent more than a dollar at the casino or buying a lottery ticket or doing some other nonsense, you know? So you can take a dollar, open your first investment account and start from there. Now, what would you tell someone who's feeling so overwhelmed because we do have the power of the internet at our disposal and there's so much information out there yeah. and they're taking in so many different things. One person is saying this, the other one is saying that and they're getting overwhelmed. What would you tell that person when it comes to the world of investing? Yeah, I think it's important to get back to the root of like why you're starting. And I talk about that in my chapter, like before I tell you anything about what the investments are and what type of accounts you should have, I ask you, you need to know why you're investing. Because that why is then going to lead you to the right accounts, to the right decisions. If you're investing for retirement, you probably want to use a retirement account like a 401k, an IRA, something that is tax advantage for that purpose. If you want to invest for a general reason, just because you want to build your money faster than you would in a savings account, you're going to use a different type of account for that. If you want to save for healthcare costs, you're going to use a different type of investment account for that. If you want to save for college, it's a different account. So you have to understand first, why do I want to invest? And then pick a lane, right? Like we don't have to be doing all the things at once. I did not start investing generally until 
I really got good at understanding my retirement accounts. And once I felt confident with that, then I said, okay, I'm going to open an investment brokerage account. And that money is just going to be for other stuff, whether that's like saving a down payment for a house or just building an emergency fund, whatever. You don't need to do all the things at once. Start with one goal, start with one why, get confident in that, and then move on and then make progress. Yes, baby steps. I want to yes. read this comment from Agnes. My 16-year-old son is right now meeting with a financial advisor. I opened him a minor Roth IRA after reading your book. Yes. She's explaining to him now that what nobody taught me growing up, he wants to retire by 35. Thank you, Janice. OMG. Can we get a round of applause for that? That's amazing. Oh, my God. I wish I was thinking about retiring at 35 when I was 16. Damn. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. We love that. And see what you're doing with your book. Like you are changing lives. Sis. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Agnes. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. A couple more questions. Chapter seven, how to become a financially independent mujer, aka hash, hashtag goals. Yes. Why is financial independence necessary, especially for women and women of color? Well, the long and short of it is that women statistically live longer than men. And so if you are in a partnered relationship where there's a man involved, you're probably going to outlive him. And that means you need to be knowing how to manage your money because at some point you're going to have to manage it yourself. Okay. How many of you have abuelas, have titis who are widows, who literally had no idea what was going on with the money? until their spouse died. Okay. We all know one of those people. And it is a very eye-opening experience when you realize everything that you thought was happening may not be the case. Right. And so financial independence for me as a woman, especially, I think it represents options. It represents the ability for you not to be stuck in an environment that is toxic to you, whether that is a relationship a workplace, a geographical location, a living environment. You know, we have a lot of stories in our circles, in our families as people of color, of women who did not have this option, who stayed in toxic marriages, who dealt with abuse, who dealt with financial control and dominance. And they would have made very different choices in their lives if they had had financial independence, if they knew that they were good either way. And that is what I want for every single person that encounters my platform to prioritize because you just never know. Life has a way of throwing unexpected things at you that you couldn't have even imagined, you know? And so when you have money, you have options to opt out of the bullshit. And that's why financial independence is important to me. We need that on a shirt too, okay? <laughs> I'll Can say, I get an amen? Out of the bullshit. <laughs> yes, period, okay? Amen. We are in church, ladies and gentlemen, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, you guys, make sure I'm putting in the link. I see the questions coming in. I only have a couple more before we get to yours, but use that link to submit your questions to Janice. Okay. Chapter eight, how to create your dinero squad. You talk about community support when it comes to your wealth building journey. How has community and mentorship played a role in your own financial journey? And what are some ways that readers can create their own dinero squad? Ooh, well, I think you're already doing that partially by being a part of the Yo Quiero Dinero platform, right? Obviously, when we do events like these book signings, when we have uh, live events, whether when I do courses and I do cohorts and all of those are opportunities, right, to build community. I have amazing communities that are part of my digital programs. Um, there's been amazing uh, networking opportunities that have come out of my event in Puerto Rico and my book um, tour locations and stop. So anytime that you have the opportunity to be in a room with like-minded people, Take those opportunities, okay? Because those can be relationships that change your life. And I have found that time and time again, relationships are the currency that has the most value. I, you know, when I have money questions, when I have business questions, when I have mental health issues, all the things, like I got a roster of incredible people that I have met 
through this platform, through my work, um, through my, you know, social activities, through Zumba. Like there's so many opportunities in our lives to create community. And I think it just comes with like giving yourself permission to put yourself out there. Even if you're an introvert like me, okay? I'm an introvert, y'all. As much as people were like, how is that possible? I, I definitely need that, okay? people recovery. <laughs> I need recovery time after socialization, okay? I need to be given 72 hours notice if you want to hang out with me. Like, you can't be calling me and be like, let's go to brunch an hour. I'll be like, bitch, no. Um, Try me next week, right? Okay? <laughs> I'm not mentally prepared for this. So you just need to put yourself out there. Get in spaces where people are having the kind of conversations that you want to be having. Um, and, you know, I think that's that's one of the superpowers of women. You know, what they've done studies with that look at lonely, loneliness rates between men and women. And women are always like statistically less lonely because we're just better at building community. We're better at, sh at showing our emotions. We're better at connecting. And so like use that as your strength. Use that as your superpower. And um, talk to people. That is the power of community. You know, when I, a great example of me even being able to write this book, I don't know anything about writing a book before this process, but I had a mentor who wrote a book. And so I literally contacted her. I'm like, how does this work? Who do I talk to? How do you put a book proposal together? Um, you know, how do you get an agent? All this stuff. And just knowing that I had that resource in my back pocket has brought this opportunity to life. So use your network. And also be a value to your own network as well. If you have opportunities to, you know, put people on and make connections, do that. And on the opposite end of that, what advice would you give to someone who's dealing with people in their lives who are negative or unsupportive when it comes to their growth, wealth building journey? It's not your job to save other people. Okay. I'm sorry, but we're all adults here. We are adults here. And um, your life is a series of choices and the consequences of those choices. And if you have found that you have keep having the same conversation with people and they don't want to take your advice at some point, go spend your energy on yourself because the people who don't want to change are not going to change. You know, I do believe people can change, but it's on their dime. It's on their time. It's not up to you. And so, um, yeah, exactly. Daisy said, boy, girl, bye. <laughs> if you are not nurturing my spirit, if you are not encouraging me, if you, every time that I spend time with you, I feel like the energy has been drained out of the room. I'm exhausted. I need emotional recovery time from you. You need to start looking at that person and be like, is this the type of thing I need to be around right now? Is this serving me? And sometimes that's going to be people that you care about. Sometimes that's going to be people you're related to. That part. Sometimes that's going to be people that you've known longer than you haven't. But there is a season for everything and everyone. And sometimes they're just people who are not meant to be in this season. And that's okay. Period. I am the queen of blocking people, okay? <laughs> she is. Queen. You piss me <laughs> off once, we're done, okay? And that's on self-care. It's the Virgo. It's the Virgo Period. energy. Period. <laughs> <laughs> All right, two more questions. Chapter nine, which is my favorite, love and dinero. Money talk in relationships can be cringe AF. Yes. What have you learned in your own journey about love and money? And what are some tips to make those conversations less awkward and more productive? Well, I think the conversations become awkward when you stall and stall and stall. You know, I think it's a lot more awkward to ask your partner of four years what their student loan situation is like versus, you know, in the first couple of months of y'all like getting serious about dating. Cause then it's just like, Oh, wait a minute. Why are we talking about this now? I think it's important to normalize talking about money the same way you talk about anything else as early as possible, because that's, you're basically in the beginning of a relationship. You're setting the ground rules. You're setting up the foundation of how this is supposed to work. And if you set up the foundation of like, we don't talk about, hard things and we don't um, address, you know, the elephant in the room type things, that's not a great way to start. You know, that's, that's what leads to a lot of assumptions. That's what leads to a lot of conversations that are not being had that should be being had. Um, so I think the sooner the better when it comes to conversations. And if somebody is very reluctant to talk, talk about their money, it's a red flag for me. 
it's a red flag for me. Like I, especially if you're thinking about moving in together, like you're thinking about taking things to the next level. I need to know, you know, and I remember talking about this with Farnoosh when she was at the, uh, our money, our power summit in Puerto Rico. We had a whole session about like being a breadwinning woman. And she talked about when she was getting ready to move in with her husband, who was her boyfriend at the time. She literally made like a date for them to go to a restaurant and she brought post-it notes and they like literally put out all of their business on the post-it notes. How much debt do I have? What's my credit score? Uh, what's my savings? Like all that stuff. How much money do you make? And it was just like, look, we're going to get some margaritas and we're going to talk about money. So however you need to have that conversation, have the conversation, but it needs to be had because finances is one of the top three reasons why people get divorced. And a lot of that comes from lack of transparency, of financial infidelity, of thinking that you, one thing is happening and it's a whole other thing. You got to know. You got to know. That's just it. Non-negotiable. Facts. Facts. And what's the biggest lesson that you learned about yourself when it comes to love and money? Um, I realized that I like the way I've always operated with money is that I love you, but I love me more. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and that's though, on Samantha from Sex in the City. Okay? okay. I love you, but I love me more. And I'm never going to put myself in a position where like, you're going to have financial control of me. I don't care. I don't care how long we've been together. I'm always going to have my own accounts. I'm always going to have my own bag. I'm not going to have to explain to you why. That's just what it is. That's what comes with me. And um, unapologetically, I mean, I think I've been like that since I was like a little kid. I remember even as young as like 11, just having this idea like, ain't no man going to tell me shit. Okay. <laughs> and that's how I operate when it comes to money. It Mom is what it is. To that. Yes, I see her <laughs> clapping. <laughs> I love that. I love that. All right. Last question. We talking to the mommies out there. Okay. Chapter 10, rich mommy money moves. This chapter focuses on empowering on empowering moms and moms to be to take control of their finances. How can mothers juggle finances and family without burning themselves out? And what advice do you offer for creating a financially secure future for themselves and their kids? The greatest gift you can give your child is a financially free mother. Okay. When your kid doesn't have to worry about your retirement, <coughs> excuse me, when they don't have to worry about you financially, when they know that you're good, that is a gift that keeps on giving. Because if you're a first gen kid that knows that pressure of having to be your parent's safety net, when your child doesn't have to experience that same stress, they can reach their full potential. You know, they know that they can work towards their financial goals without this extra pressure to make sure that they're preparing for something that's coming. And so I think that's the most empowering thing you can do as a parent. There is no loan you can take out to retire. Okay. You could take out a loan to pay for college. You can take out a loan to buy a house. You can take out a loan to buy a car, blah, blah, blah. If you are not in a financial position to extend the level of support that you want to your children, that's okay. Any level of support that you can give them is probably more than you got. So uh, you need to have that level of perspective, you know? But also, you need to make sure you're good. The oxygen mask needs to be put on. And so I think that's the thing that I want moms especially to be thinking about. There is this narrative to self-sacrifice and to be the last and to pour from an empty cup. No. A financially secure mom is a mom who is empowered and who then can empower her children to become their fully expressed selves because she's not living in scarcity and she's not living in lack. And that's what we need to be focusing on. Yes. Mic drop. I love that. That's all the questions that I have. Okay. I am getting submissions from the people. So again, I'm going to put it in the chat if you have more questions y'all got us here please take advantage of 
getting the expertise from Miss Janice. All right, first question from Jennifer Mello. Hi, Janice. I'm currently on chapter three and loving the book so far. Yes. As a as a first generation Latina, now uh, now helping the parents, titis and abuelas of our generation who are struggling to survive in this inflated economy with the lack of resources from the elderly community. Will your book be translated in Spanish? Absolutely, it will. I signed yes. the contract to have that um, translated, I want to say in the spring. And from the last that I heard, the Spanish language version of the book is going to be called Yo Quiero Dinero. So, hey, um, and I anticipate that that will be out either later this fall or early winter of 2025. So stay tuned to the newsletter and social media for more on that. And it's also going to be audiobook version in Spanish, too. In your voice? No. Okay. <laughs> I said <laughs> I'm not qualified, but thank you. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> yes, y'all. So make sure you're signed up to our newsletter so you stay up to date because y'all get the tea first before everybody else. Okay. Yes. Okay. Next question is from Agnes. Hold on. Can you share some, can you share, hold on. Can you share your ideas about buying slash running an Airbnb as an investment to diversify sources of stream and build wealth? I love Airbnb, y'all. I have one in Puerto Rico. And since I opened it up for business in May of 2023, I made like $15,000 with one property. Okay. So it's like, it's helping me uh, recoup the cost because I paid in cash for the property. So it doesn't have a mortgage, but I still have HOA fees and utilities and all that stuff. And, um, you know, I've used some of the money to renovate the bathroom and I'm going to do that with the kitchen, but it's, a, I think it, as long as you're, you do your due diligence, right. About, I think the most important thing is making sure that the city that you're trying to do Airbnb even allows that. Okay. Because I live in a city here in Pinellas County in Florida where Airbnb is not allowed. It is banned by the local city council. And so there has been a huge crackdown on people who've been doing illegal Airbnbs, they're getting reported to the city, they're getting fined, all kinds of craziness. So the most important thing I would say is make sure that you know what the laws in your local area are. Make sure that you're buying a property that allows you to do Airbnb. And, um, you know, I decided to do an LLC for my L uh, Airbnb just to keep it separate from my assets as well. For liability purposes, obviously, you're almost like running a hotel. So if somebody gets hurt, they can sue you, all types of things. So just make sure you're doing your due diligence. But I think if you have the opportunity to do it, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of Airbnb. And I was a long-term landlord in the past, too. I really like the model of Airbnb having the short-term rentals versus long-term tenants. Just because you don't have that like commitment of having to you know, deal with the same person for a year plus and depending on those uh, landlord laws in your state, it can be very difficult to get rid of a bad tenant sometimes. So I, I, I like Airbnb. I love that. I love that. <clears throat> okay. I have two questions from Patty Lopez. The first one, confidence. I'm in awe of your confidence. How did you break out of your shell? You shine so bright. Love it. Aww. Signed fellow introvert. Oh, we love that. <laughs> That's so sweet. Thank you. Confidence is a muscle. Okay. I promise you it is a muscle just like anything else. And you have to practice it. Um, I think about when I used to do speaking engagements, even like in high school, when I had to do like a speech or something, oh my God, y'all, I would break out into hives. I'd be sweating profusely. It was a hot ass mess. Okay. And I still get red, you know, when I'm talking on a stage, I still get flushed and flustered but I also have just I've gotten my out of my head about it because I've done it so much now so I think if you want to get good at being confident you have to put yourself in situations that are going to test that whether that is going on Instagram live or signing up to do improv comedy or signing up for a dance class or doing something that's like out of your comfort zone every time you do something that is out of your comfort zone and you realize that you didn't die 
it reminds you, oh, wow, I am much more capable of doing scary shit than I thought. And uh, so that's my best recommendation. Like, just do a year of yes. I don't know if anybody's ever read the book by Shonda Rhimes, The Year of Yes. It's an incredible book. I totally recommend it. And she just talks about how for a year she said, I'm just going to say yes to all the shit that I would normally say no to. And she realized at the end of that year how much she grew as a person just because when you put yourself in situations that force that growth, you'll be amazed at how much you blossom just by taking that first scary step. Yes. You got to get out of your own way and do the scary shit. Yes. I love that. Okay. Her second question is about budgeting. This is where I've been the most overwhelmed on my journey. There's so many tools, apps, and so much information, even while reading the chapter that I'm in paralysis of where to get started and the idea of quote, doing it right. I know, I know perfectionism. (laughs) What's the babiest of baby steps to get started? I think the easiest way to start budgeting is using sinking funds because it's almost like you're doing digital envelopes and you can set aside money for different categories. So when I started like getting serious about budgeting, I realized that all my money was like pooled together. So my savings account was just all the savings. And then my checking account was just all the leftovers. And it was hard for me to see, do I have enough money to pay the rent? Do I have enough money to pay the car? Do I have enough money for groceries? Do I have enough in my emergency fund? And so literally creating buckets of money, that helped me. Like separating, you know, having a certain amount of my paycheck going towards this is for rent car insurance. I always need to make sure this is properly funded. And then having another account that was like, this is for groceries and variable bills and gas and whatever. And then having a separate emergency fund and then having a separate savings account for something like, do I want to save a down payment for a car? Do I want to take a vacation? Do I need to save my deductible for if something happens to my dog and I need to take them to the vet and now I have to be out $500, right? So I think for me personally, some sort of envelope system was very useful to get started. And then once you get used to that, you know, ideally we all want to get to a place where like we're not really having to budget because you just got money flowing in and out and you've got your stuff automated and you know what's happening. But try that. Try the, whether it's a physical envelope system or a digital envelope system. I like them. There's cool tools online for that. I mentioned some of them in the book. Um, And then once I got past that point, I like the pay yourself first method. That's my personal preference because what it represents to me is it forces me to pay my goals first, my investment goals, my savings goals, making sure that like I'm taking care of future me before current me has a chance to sabotage any of that. Um, And then figuring out how to live off of the rest, right? I would rather know that my retirement is good, my savings are good, and I can figure out how to live with the rest versus spending everything up front and then hoping that you have something left over for the future. That's how we end up in a situation where, you know, time passes by and you realize like, oh, I'm not as prepared as I thought I was because I wasn't prioritizing future me before current me. Yeah, I love that. Okay, the next question is from Shelly J. My bank is very interested in investing my retirement savings. I have say in how I would like to invest, but should I do it on my own or take their help? I am a beginner, so I'm not sure how to start. Thank you. I'm not a huge fan of working with banks, honestly, to invest. I'm a fan of using dedicated brokerage companies, companies that are specific for investments like Charles Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard versus using like a Bank of America or Chase or any of those other, um, you know, mainstream banks. Just because an investment company is typically going to have lesser fees because that's their like whole bread and butter, right? When you think about a company like Fidelity, like that's all they do. They just do investments. Um, They tend to have better platforms, in my opinion, for like user friendliness. And I don't know. I just feel like I want my bank to do the banking stuff and I want my investment brokerage to do the investment stuff. It's like the same thing with your, you know, the people that try to say like insurance is an investment. No, it's not. Insurance is insurance and investment is investment. Let's keep them separate. Um, I would never 
feel comfortable allowing somebody to invest on my behalf because especially as a beginner, because I want to understand, like I'm the type of person where if I'm going to outsource something, I need to understand what I'm outsourcing first. It's like you having a company and you're hiring an employee to do a job that you don't even know what the job is because you don't understand it. You haven't done the job. Right. And so I would recommend that you educate, self-educate more on the investment process and then decide what you want to do. Because when you know what your own financial goals are, it's much easier to communicate those goals to a professional if you decide to work with someone in the future. Got it. Are, are you still doing one-on-one -on -one calls? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You can find those at um, yoquerodinerpodcast.com slash work with me. I'm going to put it in the chat. There's a couple more questions okay. slash work with me. If you guys have it, please submit it. Um, okay, this one is from Selena. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey. I am currently in my journey to learn more regarding investing and how to make my money work for me. I will say that at times I do become overwhelmed and fear slash failure comes to mind. Can you share what worked best for you and what resources helped you learn and grow in this area? Yes. So as far as the resources, again, I'll go back to podcasts. I love podcasts. That's just how I learn. Um, I think automation is probably the best solution for most of us to make it less intimidating and to just kind of take your self out of it. You know, when I was getting serious about investing, I started just upping the percentage of my paycheck that would go into my 401k. Like that just felt like the easiest step to take versus, you know, oh, I got to go open an account and then I got to figure out how much money I'm going to put in. And then I got to figure out what the investments are. It's easier when you are first starting out to just eliminate the overwhelm of decision making by just taking the easiest route. So if you have access to a 401k at work and you're not contributing, or if you're only contributing a little bit, take the first step by adding a percentage point to the amount of money that you're investing and see how that feels. Do you miss the money? Probably not. There's not going to be a big difference between you investing four or 5% of your paycheck, right? And so doing that is what I would recommend if you have access to one of these accounts. If you don't, and you know, let's say you're self-employed or something, picking a specific account, whether that's an IRA or just a regular investment brokerage account, that's a place to start. I would recommend definitely like get into the book. You know, I talk about what index funds are, what ETFs are. I give you a whole list of definitions about what these words that literally don't mean anything until you have context for them, what they mean. Because when you understand what it is that you're buying, it makes it less intimidating. You know, a lot of the terminology, when you see growth stocks or value stocks or international funds, you're like, what the fuck? I don't know. You know, <laughs> and so just learning what that stuff means is important because when you know, you can be empowered, right? Um, so, you know, dive into the chapter of the book, listen to podcasts. I I mean, we have so many investment episodes. Literally go on yoquerodinerpodcast.com and search investing. We have resource guides. We have blog posts. We have episodes. Just learn. And then when you listen to an episode, whatever it's about, let's say it's like, how do you, we have an episode like how to invest for beginners. Listen to that, right? And take one action with the information that you learn, whether that is just simply opening an account. Maybe it's not buying anything right now, but it's like, I'm going to open the account. And then when I feel comfortable enough, I'm going to put $20 in this account and I'm going to then do the research into what I'm going to buy. It can be steps. It doesn't have to be all at once. Yes. Rome was not built in a day. Facts. And neither is generational wealth. Period. We need that. Yo, <laughs> we need so many more shirts, y'all. Like so many gems <laughs> are coming out of this conversation. <laughs> I think this is the perfect last question from uh, Olivia. Oh, I love that name. What was your favorite part of becoming an author? Ooh, I think it was a photo shoot. Honestly, I was surrounded by an incredible team. My photographer, my makeup artist, my um, stylist, 
that was the first like full on glam up experience of my life. And just to know that everybody involved was a person of color, it just felt more even like monumental because I know how rare these opportunities are for people in our community to even have a book, let alone be on the face of the book that it was just amazing. And I was recently in Los Angeles and was able to um, get my makeup and hair done by the person who did the look for the book. And he was just like, girl, I didn't even realize when we did our shoot together that I was out here helping you start a movement. Okay. (laughs) So it was just amazing to be you know, in those spaces and to be able, honestly, this book created that opportunity for a woman of color photographer and a person from the LGBTQ community to do my makeup and hair and for another woman of color to be my stylist. Like, this is what happens when you put yourself out there. Like, you literally create ripple effects and opportunities and it's just wild. So I think that by far was like the coolest shit. And to think it all started in your closet. Yeah. You creating with, this with podcast. Thanks to Cardi B and J Lo. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, look at that cover. She's a baby. It is giving y'all. Barbie glam, rich bitch energy. Yes. 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 I'm here for it. I'm here for it. <laughs> I have I have one more question that I want to yeah. ask that I want to leave the people with. What is the biggest takeaway that you want people to have to listening to your story, reading your book, you know, learning your journey? What's the biggest piece of advice that you want to leave people with? I will say that where you come from and where you start does not have to be where you finish. Okay. Because I think we have a lot of examples of what it looks like to see the same cycles repeated over and over and over again. And I want you to know that you can be that cycle breaker. You can be the change that you wish to see. Um, And it starts with you making a decision that you are worthy of more and then empowering yourself accordingly to create whatever that is. Boom, mic drop. This was beautiful. And we're (laughs) running on time, y'all. We still have a little bit of time left. If you guys want to raise your hand and unmute yourself and talk, can we do to a Janice? picture? Yes, can we please? Yes, Leanne, take a group picture for everybody. Okay. Everybody, turn your cameras on if you can. Yes, we'd love to get please. a picture of the squad before please, we let y'all. y'all go. And thank you guys for being here. We appreciate y'all. Thank you. Don't thank me. Thank y'all. Okay. <laughs> All right. One two three i'm gonna do another one and one more awesome don't forget to grab your merch mi gente over here yes those qr code um we look good love to see y'all rocking the merch it's been so cool seeing people wearing it uh look (laughs) mom yes i see you mom i love it um (laughs) make sure that you get your copy of the book in both versions because i promise you the audiobook version is on another level okay it's like if you like the podcast you won't really like this audiobook and most importantly get a copy for your friends too okay because we know there are people out here who are doing bullshit with their money and we know who they are and we know that they need this information so you know be the change you wish to see by giving this for a birthday christmas is coming up you know if you have uh, a corporation that you work for that does events Get in touch with us. We're doing speaking engagements at companies. Um, we're doing, you know, bulk book orders for companies if they want to buy books and give them to the employees. So any opportunities that you guys have for me to come to you virtually or in person, please reach out. I'm trying to get this message out to as many people as possible because we're trying to start the financial revolution. Okay. Not trying, you doing. Okay. <laughs> Period. Thank you guys. I love it. Yes. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. You. you will get a copy to the replay in case you missed any of this. Um, so please make sure to check that out. And until next time, stay poderosa. Stay poderosa. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Thank guys. You. Thank you.